Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to all our viewers. Thank you once again for joining us on Ask Huda. I'm your host, Fuad Muhammad. And for those tuning in for the first time on Ask Huda, it's a platform for answering any questions you may have or clarifying any misconceptions about Islam. And the person who does all the answering on the program is our respected Islamic scholar, Dr. Muhammad Salah. Assalamu alaikum, doctor. And it's our pleasure to have you on the program. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Fuad. The pleasure is on mine. Just a quick reminder of our telephone numbers, 00-202-385-55248 or 249, or you can write to us at ask, that's ask at huda.tv. Okay, the first question here is from Brother Sai from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. He wants to know if a woman can see her dead husband after his ghusl and after he's shrouded. Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala nabiyihi wa mustafa thumma amma ba'd. With regards to seeing... Uh, the spouse after his or her death it is definitely permissible why and how simply because it is permissible for the spouse as long as they died in a state of marriage mm. or any form to wash the body of his or her spouse the spouse uh, Asma bin Umais washed the body of uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq may Allah be pleased with him and Fatima the daughter of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wrote in her bequest or will that uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib to wash her. So if it is permissible for a person to wash the entire body, then it's obviously permissible for him or her to see the face or the body of the other party after their death. Wallahu alam. Okay, and his second question, he wants to know about the authenticity of the hadith in which the Prophet wasallam or Uthman sent an expedition to find Gog and Magog, and he wants to know if they fa- found it. Uh, number one, never heard of this hadith. Number two, it doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. Why? This is one of the means of judging the authenticity of hadith. Why? Because the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sitting once, then he said, وَيْلٌ لِلْعَرَبِ مِنْ شَرٍ قَدْ اقْتَرَ He said, woe to the Arab from an evil that has approached very near. What is it? He said, today a narrow opening in the wall of Gog and Magog has been opened like that. And he circled uh, the index and the thumb. Which indicates this is a, a great deal of evil. Mm-hmm. So why would one look for it? Especially a Nabi ﷺ informed us that Gog and Magog and their emergence will be the signs that precede, the major signs that precede the occurrence of uh, the Day of Judgment. Uh, and the Muslims would have to hide from them mm-hmm. at this time. So why would he send Uthman ibn Affan in an expedition or a convoy in order to find out what are they hitting. It doesn't make sense. Wallahu alam. Okay, our next question is from Muhammad from UAE. He says he's from a Buddhist community in Sri Lanka. He works in Dubai at the moment. He wants to know why uh, Arabs are, smoke, are into smoking that much and why are they the highest consumers of cigarettes? And why, what is the solution? And why some non-Muslim countries like his doesn't have this problem? It is indeed uh, a problem and a very big problem and uh, I couldn't but agree. But I guess there has to be a law and order. Um, a few weeks back where I was dining at one restaurant in, in the States, it was the last day for designating smoking area in America, in any restaurant. Mm-hmm. So they, they, they passed the laws and they're the biggest manufacturers of cigarettes. Mm-hmm. But they export to other countries in order to smoke, to burn themselves and burn their economy. And other countries do not really mind the least. Take for instance the most sacred spot on earth, which is Mecca. It is a big dilemma where we see some people, last Hajj, I picked up a fight because I was telling somebody that you are in the Haram. Mm -hmm. He just finished the Sa'i and he stepped out. Mm -hmm. He just stepped out. And he's still in the Haram. And uh, he started smoking immediately. So simply for uh, uh, advising him that uh, forget about that smoking is haram. You are in the haram Mm. and you're still in the ihram outfit. And he said, well, it's none of your business. You find people like that. 
Will such mentality and such personality uh, mere enjoining what's right and forbid what's evil, forbidding what's evil uh, by tongue or advice uh, may not help. So there has to be law and order. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to enforce the law. Smoking is prohibited. Smoking is prohibited. If this is the case, it's not simply by raising taxes on cigarettes and cigarette manufacturer. No, it's simply because it is haram. It is harmful mm -hmm. to the individual and to the entire community. And uh, I have heard from some shiuch, they say uh, there are different opinions, you know, uh, it could be just this like. Mm -hmm. And you, if you investigate, you will find out that those who adopt these views are smokers. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. Are smokers themselves. Mm -hmm. They make a khutbah jum'ah and after the jum'ah right away, they will smoke either cigarettes or uh, jila or whatever. SubhanAllah. That is haram. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited us from harming our bodies and souls. And this is a manna that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entrusted us to look after. And the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, La darara wa la dirar. In one hospital in the Arabic countries, I was visiting somebody in the ICU. Mm -hmm. And right outside the door, on the stairs, people were lining up and smoking. Mm -hmm. So when he stood there, I said, this is called hospital. And you are in the intensive care area. Mm -hmm. Don't you get it? The person who's inside may be dying. He could be your family member, could be your son, your daughter, and your wife giving birth or whatever. They don't understand. So for people who do not understand, we have to enforce a law. Yes. To say this is haram. What happens when you say drinking is haram, but it's up to you because we're a country where it receives tourists and we cannot just ban it by the law. What happens is you have the youth end up uh, drinking. Especially when you notice that there is there has to be an age verification in, in the States and Europe, for instance. Mm -hmm. You have to show a valid photo ID that shows your age in order to be able to buy a pack of cigarettes or a can of wine or beer or whatever. That's not... Uh, uh, a condition in many of the Muslim countries which is a sign of corruption mm -hmm. and guess what it could be uh, those who are in charge could be their children and children or uh, near relatives I mean harm would be uh, widespread and the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said harm should neither be inflicted nor reciprocated so I'm sitting somewhere and I'm being affected by the smoke of somebody else who is a heavy smoker. He wants to kill himself away from haram and halal. That's his business. But me, I want to save my life. And a pregnant woman, she wants to save the, the, the fetus, the baby that she's carrying. Mm -hmm. There is no sense. So I guess there has uh, to be uh, strict rules and regulations in order to ban that. And it's simple. As it is simple for them to uh, pass laws with taxes, mm -hmm. Where people cannot afford to pay, but once they pass it, they pay. So if they say, for instance, tomorrow, in Mecca and Medina, no smoking by law. Mm. And you cannot sell nor buy a cigarette. This is it. It's over. You will not find a single person who is smoking. If they pass a law that if they find somebody littering or spitting in the street, will be penalized $100, $100, $100, 100 dirham, 100 riyal. What will happen? You would never find any person, even illiterate people, you would not find anyone spitting. Why? Mm -hmm. because there is money and money talks there is penalty yes. so uh, with regards to haram and halal I adopt the view that smoking is totally haram and how to enforce that by the law okay Jazakallah khair doctor we have brother Sadiq from Cyprus Assalamu alaikum brother we like to ask for that Assalamu alaikum Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I have two questions please okay. the one question I want to repeat from the last week because I am not clear I asking brother for permission to discuss with Sheikh uh, to understand, please. That's one question. And another, as you, your time, you answer. Okay, Sheikh, go quickly. Uh, ask the question, yes, please. Yes, please. Sheikh, uh, I told that uh, I'm living in Cyprus with my wife. Mm -hmm. My, I don't have no guardian here, and my wife also no guardian here, and she is Yatim, and she is new Muslim. So I went to marry in Islamic center. Mm -hmm. That they didn't. I didn't know that Muslim should know need wali. But she didn't tell me about, they didn't, from the Islamic center, they didn't tell me. Just they okay. make our marriage without wali, but there was two witnesses. I used to know, Sheikh, is my marriage is halal that without wali? 
Okay, and your second question? And uh, second question is it, uh, about the tablik jama. It's my country, they call people to come masjid and they send uh, some people to other city, other masjid. They mm-hmm. go their local people. And they show too many hadith that if you go for deen or dawa, you will reward for heaven, this, this, this. Mm-hmm. Please explain, am, uh, uh, am I right to go for this kind of tablet? They okay. Uh, okay. publish Islam, people call to salat uh, or pray, everything. Okay, got it. Or Brother other Sadek. things, please. Brother so, Sadek, thank you got very it, much. Jazakallah khair. Brother Sadek there from Cyprus. Uh, Dr. Muhammad, did you did answer this question, uh, his first question many times, but if you can just give it to... Uh, first of all, mm-hmm. a man does not need a wali. Mm-hmm. Only a woman who yes. needs a wali. Once a woman accepts Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not give a walaya or superiority or guardianship for a non-believer over a believer. Mm -hmm. So in this case, if you don't have any of your family members, male family members who is is a a Muslim, then the walaya will be given to any local Muslim who is a community leader, an imam of a local masjid. If you guys married in the masjid and you did not know about this rule and the person who married you is a local imam, your marriage is valid. Insha'Allah, and there is no problem with that. You don't have to worry about that. Now, just it, it's it's best to appoint a wali or a representative of her so that she understands that she has somebody to speak on her behalf. Let's say if he is the local imam who married you, that's perfectly fine. With regards to the second question, it was answered repeatedly. And alhamdulillah, the answer is already described and it is in the Fatwa Bank on our website. You can go back to it. Okay, Jazakallah Khair. Brother Hamza from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia says, since hearing the, the, your fatwa, he didn't, he stopped wearing his clothes below the ankle. But he said, however, I still have some clothes that are long and I keep them folded all the time. Mm. Can I pray with it like that? Um, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as it is narrated in the sound hadith, which was collected by Imam Muslim, forbade one from cuffing his, uh, or folding his sleeves, or his izar, or his pants, or his clothes, or his hair in the salah. With regards to the effective cause of the prohibition, some said this is an act of worship, so you stick to it even though there is no explanation, as many things. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah have mercy on him, explained that coughing in many cases led to uncovering the awra. So based on his explanation, if coughing leads to uncovering the awra, then it is prohibited in uh, the salah. So the answer will vary based on those who consider there is an effective cause, such as Ibn Taymiyyah, or those who say uh, it's a tawqifi matter, mm-hmm. that there is no active, effective cause that was mentioned, so we have to stick to it. And accordingly, they generalize. They say cuffing or folding the sleeves or the pants is uh, disliked, whether in the salah or outside the salah, even if somebody have it uh, cuffed, or fold it before the salah, has to make sure that he unfolds his clothes uh, once he enters the salah. Okay, we have Sister Sophia from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum, Sister, you're live on Ask Huda. Amen, alaikum, salam. I have one. Uh, if someone goes to the masjid to pray, mm-hmm. and following the imam, and he ha- he's following a certain school of thought, so after the salah, the, the imam says uh, two salam, but he follows a school of thought that says one. After the prayer, mm-hmm. he starts all over again to say the prayer. Okay. What, what is the ruling of that? Okay. Jazakla khair. Sister Safiya there from Nigeria. We also have Sister Sana from Qatar. Assalamu alaikum, sister. You're live in Askuda. Yes, alaikum salam. I wanted to ask, I have a daughter, I have one girl who uh, works for me, wanted to go to Umrah, but I can't translate it, uh, how to do in Umrah. Okay. I am here in Qatar, go to Umrah, but I can't translate what she talk, what she do. Can you uh, tell for her what she do? Okay, okay, okay. how to do the Umrah. Okay, okay. okay. you're okay. welcome. Thank okay, you. that's Sister Sana there from Qatar. Okay, Brother Abdullah from Qatar, he also, he wants to know, um, if someone indulges in acts of disbelief, like very worshipping or leaving the five daily prayers, can someone say that that person is a kafir or a disbeliever? No, it is not for ordinary people or common folk to judge others with disbelief. As long as the person says, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, acknowledges Islam and uh, testifies to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, if somebody acts 
against the shahada or mm -hmm. contradicts in his actions the concept, the articles of faith or belief will be brought to court and will be confronted with his actions because there is something called ignorance or uh, not being aware of certain facts. So in this condition, they have to be faced with these uh, uh, terms and they have to be educated. So if somebody says, well, I understand that by still, I ignore the prayer deliberately. I don't believe that we should pray. In this case, the person chose to uh, be non-Muslim. But it is not up to us as individuals to judge any person uh, because you have not seen him praying or because he is drinking or whatever you say that you are a kafir. Because you got to understand that it's a big, big thing to judge any person that he or she is not a Muslim while they are. Because the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said, if somebody says to his brother, Ya kafir, O oh, disbeliever, فَقَدْ بِهَا أَحَدُهُمَا Then one of them is a kafir. Either the person who is accused is truly a kafir, and if he's not, and in this case, the person who accused him has become a kafir, simply as a result of accusing others with kufr. So, don't play with fire. If somebody mm -hmm. does not show the acts of kufr, we do not dig nor fetch in their hearts in order to find out whether they're truly believers or not. We had the hypocrites who were living at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. He knew them by their names. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala notified him. Yet, he did not declare their identity. He did not confront them in public. Because if somebody says, I am a Muslim, then he is a Muslim. Musa ibn Zayd on one of the battlefield, and the story is very famous, uh, was about to kill one of the enemies who hurt the believers a lot. So once he was ready to kill him and he overcame him, uh, he said, well, I'm a Muslim. He said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Anyone in Osama's position would have done the same as Osama. What did he do? He still killed him. Why? I assume that the person is, is only pretending. But when an Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knew that he was very upset and harsh on Osama, and he kept telling him that, أَقَتَلْتَ مُسْلِمًا يَا Usama, Have you just killed a Muslim, a believer? Do you know the consequences of killing a believer? But Ya Rasulullah, he was a disbeliever, and he came on the way to fight against us on the battlefield, and based on that, I killed him. He said, but he said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. He said, Ya Rasulullah, he only said it in order to save his life. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was furthermore upset, and he said, Halla shaqaqta an sadri? Did he cut open his chest? Did you know what's in his heart? That's between him and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So one has to be very careful with that. Okay, we have Brother Hamza from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum, brother. You're live on Ask Huda. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sir, I love you both for the sake of Allah. Ahabbak alladhi ahbabtana fih. Ya Allah, the one who loved us for his sake, love you as well. Sir, I asked the questions last Tuesday. Maybe they were not answered. But can I ask them again? First question is that uh, I was b b first before very bad now, Alhamdulillah, Allah Jadat, now I have become good. So I have all the clothes which have, most of the clothes are, uh, you know, below mm -hmm. the knees. So I am folding and keeping them. Mm -hmm. I am not, means not only for the prayer, for the whole time. Means. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Okay, Brother Hamza, we just answered that question. If you can look at the rerun, we will see the complete answer Dr. Muhammad Salah gave to that question. Okay, okay, sorry, sorry. One more question mm -hmm. I have. Mm -hmm. That uh, during the sala, the sitting of the tashahud okay. in, in the Maghrib prayer, for okay. example, I sat for two rakat, then I sat for tashahud, then third rakat, then mm -hmm. I sat for tashahud. Mm -hmm. So I have to sit with cross leg, no? That is the sunnah, no? Okay, okay, got it. Got so it then, then when the Okay, I think I think I got your question, Brother Hamza. Don't worry. We also have Brother Muhammad from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Salam alaikum, brother. You live on Ask Huda. Wa alaikum as ya wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Go ahead, brother. I love you for the sake of the Lord. Thank you, Muhammad. What is about this calling somebody Qatar? Is it for. It's uh, right to call uh, this uh, Shia people Okay, okay. Uh, that's a good question. Okay. 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 Does that uh, Brother Muhammad there from the no, king? The okay, go ahead, go ahead. 
Okay, I think we lost Brother Muhammad. Okay, Abdullah wants to know if friends can sleep over at friends' house. Uh, it depends. Mm -hmm. Meaning, if uh, if youth uh, want to spend the night at their friend's house, and their friend's house and parents or family are trustworthy people, and so there is a supervision and monitoring, it is definitely permissible. It's like just going for camping, but this is indoor camping. No problem whatsoever. But I wouldn't let just my son say, I'm, I'm going for a slumber party or sleep over somewhere without investigating. Because uh, as we know that a sahibu sahib, mm -hmm. he spends some time with somebody, if this person is wicked or corrupt or you know, with bad manners, mm -hmm. it would only take a couple of hours for this person to persuade another to show him a porn a movie mm -hmm. or a bad magazine or give him um, uh, some weed or give him a drink or, or, or. So one night can ruin the, 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 the future of my son uh, if, if I don't know. With the, with the girls, one has to be a little more strict, especially nowadays where it has become very widespread, the fitna of using the cell phone cameras, even in the fitting rooms, they uh, install cameras in here and there. Uh, uh, the sisters have to be very careful. Where did they go and where did they take off uh, their clothes? Uh, you have to make sure that you are in a place where the people are trustworthy uh, within an amana. Okay, and um, Sister Amina from Nigeria, she works with the Zakah house. She helps to distribute zakah. But she says while distributing the zakah, of course, Yanni, there's some expensive that are not paid. She, took, she takes her money from her pocket mm. and she pays it. Mm -hmm. But her money doesn't reach the nisab. She wants to know if this counts as zakah on her behalf. Any person who does not possess the nisab, the minimum amount which is zakatable, mm -hmm. does not owe any zakah. Mm -hmm. So what this kind of payment or charity will be considered? Just regular sadaqah. The word sadaqah is uh, more general than the zakah. Mm -hmm. Sadaqah covers the voluntary and the obligatory uh, charity. While the word zakah is only limited to the mandatory charity which mm -hmm. a Muslim must pay if he possesses a certain amount for a certain uh, time. So if she's doing that, may Allah bless her, and this is a voluntary charity. Okay, Um Abdullah from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, she says if someone experiences hardship and difficulty in, her, in, uh, in his life, how can he differentiate whether this is a fitna for him, a test, mm -hmm. or an adab from Allah? Okay, what difference would it make? Mm -hmm. If somebody, for instance, lost his uh, or her son or daughter, okay, he would sit and say that may be a punishment or this is a test. I am already in a test. Instead of investigating, I should consider the following. What am I supposed to do in these circumstances? I'm supposed to be patient. I'm supposed to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even for the test or the trial I'm being through. I'm supposed to hop and expect the reward for my patience and endurance for this calamity, right? Meanwhile, we have heard Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and others, may Allah be pleased with him, saying that uh, I can recognize the result of my sin in the behavior of my uh, wife or my ride. So he refers any um, irregularity in his life to maybe he has committed a sin. Somebody said, uh, he forgot whatever he memorized. He said, I remember that I have committed a sin so many years back, that was a sin. I looked at the aura of a woman for innocence. Mm -hmm. Muhammad ibn Sirin, may Allah have uh, mercy on him, when he uh, did a very righteous act, when uh, the, he was told that he was a merchant as well. He was a great Muslim scholar and he was a merchant. So he lost his entire uh, uh, goods and uh, capital sum as well because he was told that they found a mouse in the barrels of uh, oil that he possessed and he was uh, he prepared for sale. So he decided to pour and get rid of all the oil because he was not sure in which one uh, the mouse went through or it was in the machine of squeezing the seeds or whatever. So he lost his entire money and he went bankrupt. He said that may be because a sin that I committed 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it is good for a person to try to have self-accounting and self-assessment and say perhaps I have done something bad. But meanwhile, I should not stop at that. I should not uh, have this guilt feeling kill me. I should move forward. I say this is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. مَا أَصَابَ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مِّنْ قَابِلِ أَنَّ أَبْرَأَهِ No calamity that befalls a believer uh, whether on earth, within yourselves, but it was already preordained before 
you were created and before the calamity was created. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, how excellent is the case of a believer. Whenever uh, God touches him, he is grateful. And whenever bad touches him or he's tested with a calamity, he is patient. And that too is good for him. And no one behaves like that except a believer. Wallahu alam. Okay, Sister Sabah from the UAE. Assalamu alaikum, Sister. You're live on Ask Kuda. Okay, I think we lost Sister Sabah there. Um, Sister Nashaba from the United States of America. She says the Sunnah for, for Fajr is that you read Surah Al-Kafirun and Surah Al-Ikhlas. Can we do this every time we pray there? As a matter of fact, uh, reciting Surah Al-Kafirun, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ mm-hmm. After reciting Surah Al-Fatiha in the first rakah, then reciting Surah Al-Ikhlas, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ After reciting Surah Al-Fatiha in the second rakah, mm-hmm. was narrated in several sound hadith with regards to, as an Imam Muslim narrated for innocence, that the Prophet ﷺ used sunnah, to pray sunnah. the two rakahs before Fajr, the Sunnah, and mm-hmm. he would recite Surat Al-Kafirun in the first rakah and Al-Ikhlas in the second. And he would do the same in the two rakahs of Sunnah Al-Tawaf. Mm-hmm. Every time he would perform Tawaf, two rakahs behind the station of Ibrahim, and also recite the same. Uh, Salat Al-Istikhara, it is recommended to do the same. And the two rakahs, the Sunnah of Maghrib. So what if somebody adopts reciting these two surahs? Uh, respectively in every two uh, sunnah he offers it's okay but it is recommended not to keep it all the time why because we have learned from our mother the mother of the believers Aisha may Allah be pleased with her as she narrated in Sahih Bukhari she said إن كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لا يدع العمل وهو يحبه خشة أن يفرض على أصحابه sometimes the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم would quit practicing certain sunan, such as al-duha prayer. Mm-hmm. That sometimes he would pray it for so long that they would think it's a fart. But he would interrupt the prayer and he would not pray it for some time so that he will cl- clarify to the ummah, it isn't a fard. It isn't obligatory or mandatory. So we should not make it mandatory upon ourselves to recite in every prayer the same. So alternate. So maybe every once in a while you recite other surahs. Okay? But... As she said, that can I recite them on a regular basis, but I sh- you should interrupt at some times. Yes, it is permissible. Okay, we have Brother Amis from Qatar. Assalamu alaikum, brother. You're live on Ask Kuda. Assalamu alaikum, brother. Go yes, ahead, brother. Uh, how are you, Sheikh? And how are you, both of you? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. My, question is, uh, my question is regarding the kutba of the Friday prayer. Mm-hmm. I'm from India and the thing is that we have many confusion, confusion regarding the belief there. Because, you know, it's like uh, some people, in a, even in our area, different masjids have different kutbas in, I mean, the languages. Mm-hmm. Some uh, masjids have in Arabic language and some have our native language. And actually, I was, pro- I was brought up in uh, Doha only from the beginning itself. But when I went to India this time, I have seen in from uh, one area and it's very, really interesting. One area people go to one masjid and in, in this masjid and uh, this is Arabic uh, kutba, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, it's Arabic speech. And the other one is the native language speech. And the people brother, are... Uh, brother, can you hear me? Together. So what is the question? Sure, sure, what, what is the question exactly? What's your question? My question is like, uh, is it, uh, what is the actual, uh, for the Friday prayer? Okay. The kutba should be in which language? It can be in somebody's native language or it should be okay. Arabic. Okay. Jazakallah. Okay. Okay. Barakallah. Mm-hmm. Brother, any Khutbah there? al-Jum'ah or Friday sermon mm-hmm. uh, should be delivered in the language of the Qur'an, in Arabic. Mm-hmm. What if the audience do not know Arabic? What if the audience are all French, do not understand an Arabic word? Then it doesn't make any sense to give a khutbah in Arabic. Yes. They do not understand neither Arabic nor English, rather Urdu then give the khutbah in Urdu. Yet, the main constituents of the khutbah, which are the minimum requirement, is praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sending the peace and salutation upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and quoting either uh, uh, one verse, one verse from the Qur'an, the khutbah can be sufficient if the person recited one verse. 
And a hadith from uh, the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Obviously, when I give the introduction, I say it in Arabic, then I say it in English, if I'm speaking to English audience. Then uh, also, if I quote an ayah, I recite it in Arabic. Recite it, not just read it, recite it. Then give its meaning. So by that, we can compromise and we can make everybody happy. If I give a khutbah in any Islamic center in, in, in the States, where I have the audience 50-50, Arab and non-Arab, but I understand that the vast majority of people who are living in the States understand English. Then I have to accommodate everybody. Then I would quote the verses and the hadith in Arabic, but I would translate them in English. The purpose of Khutbatul Jumu'ah is to inspire the believers in order to resume the religious commitment to the next Jumu'ah. So if they set uh, 10, then they leave without understanding a word that doesn't make sense. Okay, Jazakla Khair, Doctor, for clarifying that. It's time for a break here on Al School and we'll be back right after this. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hadith Principles. Join Sheikh Amr Amonet in this program of Hadith Principles wherein we are going to know the transmission of hadiths, the weak, the good, and the authentic hadith. The hadith study is very important in Islam. Islam has very specific teachings, beliefs, and actions that come from particular sources. The credentials of the narrators, are there certain qualifications or qualities that are to be fulfilled in the narrator himself for a hadith to be accepted from him? We're learning about the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Peace and blessings be upon him. And the great work and efforts into preserving this valuable source of Islamic teaching for all of us. Hadith Principles. Soon in Ramadan on Hoda TV. <laughs> Closing the Gap. Why closing the gap? In this program, Sheikh Yusuf Estes and Omar Dunlap are going to discuss how to bridge the gap between peoples of different cultures and orientations. The gap between males and females, Muslims and non-Muslims, the East and the West. Human beings feel like that they're being slighted one way or the other. The gap between the youth and the elders, the gap between various uh, status in working, the work field and education and then trying to provide solutions for these particular problems. All of this and more in Closing the Gap soon in Ramadan on Hoda TV. Amazing Stories in this program, we get to know about people of the past whose stories were mentioned in the Islamic tradition and related by the Prophet, peace be upon him. That verily, us, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we tell you about the best of the stories. We tell you about the best of the stories. When we narrate a story, when we read a story, when we try to benefit from a story, what we are trying to do in reality is to go back through the steps, through the different parts and sections of this story until the story is actually completed and that we can take the actual benefit directly from the story. Sheikh Lutfi will narrate these stories in his program Amazing Stories. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered one of the lands to come closer, the destination. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered one whole city to come closer, to move closer to this dead person. Amazing Stories. Soon in Ramadan on Hoda TV. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's good to have you back. You're watching Ask Huda. Just a quick reminder of our telephone numbers 00202385552482449. Or you can write to us at ask, that's ask, at huda.tv. Okay, Dr. Muhammad, Sister Nashaba from the United States, her second question. She wants to know if making dua in jama'ah is considered to be an innovation. 
And I, what she meant from her question is like for, for the imam to make a dua after every uh, congregational prayer. Okay. Bismillah rahman rahim First of all, with regards to making dua in jama'ah, where one person will make dua, mm-hmm. and the audience will say ameen, meaning, oh Allah respond. In general, it is permissible. Mm-hmm. And the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam witnessed and attended sessions like that, such as the story of Abu Hurairah, may Allah be pleased with him, when him and his companions were making dua, then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam appeared before them, and he made a very interesting dua. He asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him a powerful memory, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ameen. So that was uh, done during the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is approved. Uh, after a session or ta'aleem, if the Imam makes dua and the audience say, Ameen, that is a congregational dua. One person is invoking and the others are supplicating. I mean, it is permissible and recommended. But it becomes an act of innovation when we choose certain times to practice these uh, ibadat on a regular basis, unlike what the Prophet ﷺ used Allah to do. Because we have throughout the life of the Prophet ﷺ, five times a day that they prayed in congregation, right? And the companions have witnessed every prayer with the Prophet ﷺ in jama'ah, even at the time of his death, uh, when he was sick, the sickness of his death. So none of them have ever narrated that the Prophet ﷺ prescribed or did or uh, recommended to make congregational dua after the prayer. Mm-hmm. There is one hadith which says that um, the, the, the dua which is most likely to be answered, asma'u dua is a dua at the end of the night or by the end of the prayer whether before the taslim after the tashahud and before the taslim or after the person makes khitam salah as ibn al-qayyim said may allah mercy on him makes khitam salah and the tasbih and the dhikr then he makes dua it is permissible but for the imam to turn around and to make this in congregation this is an act of innovation that was not prescribed nor practiced or approved by the Prophet sallallahu So now we notice the difference because some people say that they prevent us from making dua. That is not true. It is only how you make dua and the, 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 the timing and the regular basis where some people invent certain things. But the dua itself is praiseworthy at any say time. Okay, Sister Um Ali from Oman. Salaamu alaikum, Sister, you're live on Askur. Your questions, please. Salaamu alaikum. Wa alaykum as Go ahead, sister. Uh, if a woman wants to go to Umrah of Christ, what does she do? Okay. Okay, Jazakallah Khair, Sister Um Ali there from Oman. And if we can answer her question and the question... Okay, we, we have Brother Abdullah from India. Assalamu alaykum, brother. You're live on Ask Huda. Brother Abdullah, are you with us? Okay, Brother Abdullah, you can call again, no problem. Okay, Sister Um Ali and Sister Sana from well, Sister Sana from uh, from Qatar, she wants to know if you can briefly outline uh, the the steps for making Umrah. And Sister Um Ali wants to know if a woman wants to go to Umrah or Hajj, what are some of the prerequisites? Sure, Inshallah Azza But before I answer, uh, let me refer you to the programs which we pre-recorded and they were aired uh, several times. Mm-hmm. And you can also find them on the Saudi airline if you're, for instance, flying Saudi airline on every flight. Mm. There is um, uh, a program for Huda TV and it shows how to perform Hajj and Umrah. Mm-hmm. Uh, if not, then you can just uh, type Hajj step by step and you'll pull out about 13 episodes of how to perform Hajj and Umrah properly. Where most people travel long distances and they spend their entire life saving and they go home without performing a proper hajj or umrah. So this program, alhamdulillah, shukullah, it assisted a lot of people and it showed them how to perform hajj and umrah properly and avoid innovations and fabrications and economize their hajj and make it in the most perfect way. So hajj and umrah, hajj step by step. The program is called hajj step by step. Uh, you will find it on YouTube and many other uh, websites. Also for the brother who asked about the sitting in the middle tashahud versus the last tashahud, it would be best if you can visualize it. And that was uh, aired in a, in a program that was filmed or recorded in the name of the Prophet's prayer. 
uh, again it's about 13 episodes it will help you a lot at least you'll be able because when we read in the prescription of the prophet's prayer you may not comprehend not unless if you see it uh, yeah, see somebody who's mm-hmm. uh, demonstrating so i would refer you to the program which is called the prophet's prayer and you will find it also if you just type the prophet's prayer uh, but briefly with regards to how to perform umrah it's as simple as that number one the first pillar is ihram and ihram is assuming the intention of immersing into the act of either umrah or hajj mm-hmm. with regards to the umrah it's only umrah and you pronounce the talbiyah or saying labbayka allahumma umratan at a designated area depending on uh, your emerging point, where are you coming from? You pass by certain areas called Mawaqit, or pointed areas that if you're coming from different directions towards Mecca, before crossing this area, that or at this area, or if you're flying in line with this area, you say, لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ عُمْرَةً So if you're flying, it is recommended for you to put on your ihram if you're a male, beforehand, mm-hmm. before you board the plane. And men and women, at the time of passing by the miqat, they will make the talbiyah, لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ عُمْرَةً Then we will resume making talbiyah until they reach Mecca and enter the haram. And once you see the Kaaba, you seize the talbiyah. And you begin with the second pillar of Umrah, which is At-Tawaf, circumambulating, or making seven rounds around the Kaaba, beginning from the black stone corner, ending up at it, uh, after performing seven rounds counterclockwise without going into details. A tawaf requires tahara. So the person must maintain purity from the minor and major impurities. If a woman is experiencing her menses, she cannot perform tawaf. She must wait until she's pure. Then after taking rust, she can make the tawaf. That is the second pillar. Mm-hmm. The third pillar is a sa'i. Is a sa'i. Between as safa and Marwa. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, in as safa and Marwa min sha'ari Allah. And that too is seven rounds. But each trip counts as one. Mm. So from as safa to al Marwa, that's one trip. Coming back from al Marwa, these two hills, uh, right by the Kaaba, uh, coming back from al Marwa towards as safa, that is the second trip. And so on, back and forth. So you begin with as safa. And you will find yourself at the seventh trip, ended up at Al Marwa. Once you're done the sa'i, your umrah is complete, and you're just waiting for the uh, procedures or the ceremonies of exiting from the state of ihram. Because while you were in the state of ihram, since you said, Labbaik Allahumma umratan, and you assumed the ihram, there were so, uh, certain restrictions, such as uh, avoiding having any uh, intimate relations with one's spouse. Um, such as uh, not cutting, nor shaving, trimming, or removing any hair or nail from the body, and avoiding uh, wearing any fragrance or cologne or perfume, or even washing uh, the hands or the body with scented shampoo or body wash or soap, Mm -hmm. Uh, such as for men wearing any stitched clothes, so you can go back to the program and review all the restrictions or the mahzurat of ihram. Once you're finished with the sa'i, now you exit from the state of ihram by shaving or trimming based on your choice. For women, for women, it is only trimming as much as a finger uh, tip, uh, one centimeter or so. But for uh, a male, it is highly recommended to shave because the Prophet sallallahu alaihi to shave the head, not the beard. Mm-hmm. For the beard, it is to save, not mm-hmm. to shave. Uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam prayed for those who shaved their heads uh, upon during the tahallul. Uh, tries, رحم الله المحلقين, رحم الله المحلقين, رحم الله المحلقين. And when he was asked every time about only those who trim or shorten, he said in the fourth time, and may Allah have mercy on those who trim as well. So by doing that, you finish the ceremonies of Umrah, and it can take two hours, uh, average two hours, it depends on, on the rush. After that, you can just spend the time visiting the haram and praying and, and so on. There are certain sunan mm-hmm. or tradition to be done, such as drinking from zamzam water after the tawaf and praying the two uh, uh, rakas of sunnah to tawaf, the invocations to be recited, all of that you will find in details in the program of Hajj step by step. Okay, we have Brother Muhammad from Sweden. Assalamu alaikum, brother. You're live on Askuda. Assalamu uh, alaikum wa rahmatullah. 
وعليكم, وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. جزاك الله خير شيخ عند اول دي بيرسونز هو وركينج فور وجزاكم. شانيل اند اس اس امين. بيوتيفول تو هاف شانيل وي بيبول ذات وي هاف وي وي ليف هير ان نيويورك. Uh, my question is uh, that uh, I'm um, uh, I have uh, my family here in Sweden and I uh, uh, my wife she's uh, Swedish uh, uh, and uh, alhamdulillah she's uh, being uh, Muslim alhamdulillah mm-hmm. and uh, my situation as now is not so uh, uh, so uh, 100% uh, clear so uh, Uh, I, I was about the period to working in a uh, restaurant. Uh, mm-hmm. what, what, what kind of situation you're talking about? Uh, as, as yet, I, I, I didn't have my papers here. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, it's not uh, permissible to, that I can have uh, normal work or uh, to make... You don't have a work permit, like etc. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I, I was obliged to, to working. Uh, that's the, the only possibility is to working in uh, in uh, wrestling. Uh, and uh, you know, wrestling here. Mm. Okay, I got your question, Mohammed. But you said you're married to um, a, a citizen. Wouldn't that give you a work permit and um, residency? Uh, this is not the, my. Uh, this is not. Uh, it, it wasn't my my. Uh, Uh, Regardless of uh, your intention, I'm talking about now you're legitimately married, so it's supposed yeah. to give you immediately a work permit and social security, etc. Yeah, inshallah. So, yeah, inshallah. Uh, y- yeah, you said at the moment, yes. it's not, you didn't get it as yet. Isn't it? Uh, no, process. not yet. Not okay. yet. Mm. I, I, I really want to advise you, myself, and all of those who travel from Muslim countries in order to work uh, serving pork or wine, or washing yeah. dishes, yeah. while they may have uh, um, higher degrees in their countries, uh, we were not created to work for dunya. We're created yeah. to work for our akhira uh, and hereafter. Uh, every moment you spend in a filthy place like that, I mean with filthy place that washing dishes, it's not a shameful act, but washing dishes for people who've eaten pork or yeah. drinking wine, it's a shame for, for a Muslim. So uh, it will be only permissible in case of necessity, where if you don't uh, find any other job, to the extent that you'll be uh, expelled from your uh, rental property or, 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 then it's permissible temporarily. But I, I'm afraid that people just uh, rely on that and they continue working in, in a field which is haram. Your country is more worthy with you. I know that the financial situation, economical circumstances is not pleasing to in, in, in most Muslim countries, but uh, I'm afraid that I would die while standing in, in, in a filthy place. And what am I going to tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Uh, I have to prepare an answer for those questions. I hope those words which are uh, truly coming from my heart would reach the heart of every young man who's so desperate in his uh, country, and he believes that heaven is awaiting for him out there. No. No. This is not the case. Many, many people lose their deen and dunya and they stay for 10, 20 and 30 years without getting papers, without getting a decent job, without making any money. So they lost everything. I hope and I pray and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you're not one of them and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for you and your wife to find a lawful job. Amen. 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 Okay, Sister Sophia from Nigeria, she says that If someone prays behind an imam who's following a specific madhab and the follower is following a specific madhab and she gave an example, for example, the imam makes one salam and the follower wants his madhab says to make two salams. Mm. She says after that, the person who was following the imam got up and he redid his salah. Why? She wants to have All of correct. that I discussed in the program of the Prophet's prayer mm-hmm. and I showed even the variations and the differences. If you pray with any madhab, your prayer is valid. If you put your hands beneath the navel, even though this, uh, this is a Hanafi madhab, and it is not the, the, the more right, and it's not the Jumhur madhab, yeah, it is, it is uh, valid, your prayer is valid. These are all hayat, do not affect the validity of your prayer. But we're required to search for the most sound and the most right way that the Prophet ﷺ used to do things, most particularly the prayer. And alhamdulillah, shukla, we put our hands on the sound references. So we gotta follow that. What if you pray behind an imam, for instance, who happened to be Shafi'i, he's making qunut uli in Fajr. Raise your hands and may say ameen behind him. And your prayer is valid. And his prayer is valid 
as well. So do not think it's a different religion or it's one of the parties of the 72 or 6 whom the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that they will go astray. Now these Mazahib, Shafi'i, wa Ahmad, wa Malik, wa Imam wa Hanifa, the greatest Imam, may Allah have mercy on all of them, are all the Imams of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah and they are the leaders and the representatives of the mainstream of the Ummah. The Imam's prayer is valid based on his madhab and your prayer even if you're following a different madhab and after the prayer you don't have to redo it because the prayer was valid if you fulfilled other conditions and requirements. Wallahu a'lam. Okay, Jazakallah Khair Doctor for being with us today. We'd like to thank all those who participated in our pro program today by calling or sending that email. And if you still have a question, you can write to us at ask ask at huda.tv and don't forget you can support this program or any other program on Huda TV just by sending that email at support at huda.tv and don't forget you can become an active member of Huda TV just by joining the website www.huda.tv until next time I leave you in Allah's care Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaikum If my love is attached to thee then from sins I will be free each time my heart will beat, your name will resound with heat. Allah is my heart's speech, your mercy is what I beseech. Keep in my heart your remembrance and in your deen allow me to advance. Help me in my quest, permit me to pass the ultimate test. Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test